Uh, this is literally the last thing I have to do for my master's program is to do an oral presentation in front of my peers mm -hmm. and yeah. send it in and I'm done. So, Perfect. At least you got it. Feels good. Uh, two years of, uh, of hard work here is, is kind of just going to be a little, just a little synopsis of the study that I had to do. This picture has absolutely nothing to do with uh, the presentation, by the way. That's just my view for the last week. Literally, that's where I camped for all week. Where was that? Uh, Ventura Beach, for Rio. Oh. Geez. Back up RV, nice. opened up the back. We've got a little yeah. balcony right there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Anyway, the study dealt with uh, things that are much more close to home, so I'll talk for the same thing I did up there. And the study dealt with things that um, that I've learned over the last two years. And I've i got to put it into practice, the stuff that we've learned. And some of the things we had to do is we had to identify a problem and to figure out, okay, so there's some things going on in your classroom, identify the problem. And so I came up with a couple different problems. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the name of my study. Change engagement, flip the classroom. We'll talk about the flip classroom in a little bit here. So one of the problems I came up with here is the predator. Predator versus imperfect is one of those hardest things we ever do. Uh, the predator regular was done in December. I started my study in January. And in January, we had, of course, the irregular predator, just the first six verbs of the irregular predator. And then I knew that that was going to be leading into the predator versus the imperfect. And it's one of those things that all the students that, uh, struggle constantly. So I thought this would be a good place for me to start with, uh, with one of the problems. Other problem I had. It's nothing new to anybody. It's been going on forever since education has started. Disengagement. Kids will sit there and stare at me, and look at me, and there's nobody home. You just know there's nobody home. You stop and you go back and go, where were you guys five seconds ago? And they'll let me know for that, yeah. uh, you know, I've got, I've got plenty of these guys in my classroom. <laughs> A lot of these guys in my classroom, not too many of these, but they're out there. But. Uh, one of the problems I had was, okay, how do I get these kids a little bit more engaged in what we're doing with this? So, I had to look at the big picture and figure out how am I going to reach these kids and how am I going to make certain that they understand the preterite is so important that they really need to know this stuff. So during this, uh, this program that I took at Concordia, we learned about the flipped classroom. And the flipped classroom is basically taking what we used to do, stand in front of everybody like I'm doing right now, I'm telling you about things. They take notes or whatever, we do a little bit of practice and they go home, they practice at home. You flip it around so that at home they watch the lesson, understand what the lesson is, they come into class and then I as a teacher was able to walk around and guide individual groups and students rather than having them listen to me talk about prior tense and how it all forms and everything else worked out pretty well for the most part. So that's what I wanted to study. Those were, that was the problem, that's kind of the solution I was looking at. So I had to come up with a couple different research questions. And one of them was, okay, how will the use of a flipped classroom impact the academic achievement? How are their grades going to be affected by, the, by this flipped classroom? The other one I wanted to know was, okay, are they going to be more engaged? Are they going to be listening to me, going to be watching me? Are they going to be involved in what we're dealing with? day-to-day -day basis in class. Um, I have to go through all these different things right here. So I took my Spanish two classes, which I had four Spanish two classes last year. Uh, primarily sophomores, obviously, a few freshmen and juniors, and one poor senior, God bless him. Uh, started in, in January, so we were going over chapter 3A, and, and I wanted to focus only on the grammar. I just wanted to make it so micro-focused that I could do a study relatively in a short period of time and see what kind of effects we have here. So chapter 3, I went through the four irregular verbs of as, hacer, estar, tener, and poder. It also had he and said in there. And it dealt with direct object pronouns. Pretty heavy stuff. Kids are going to disengage from them pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So that's what I wanted to focus the study on. And I had to come up with an intervention. So I'm looking at flipped classroom, I'm looking at the two problems. What am I going to do? So my intervention went over several different days. Uh, the very first day coming back from Christmas break, I gave them a pre-intervention survey. Basically said, be brutally honest with me. What do you think about the way I deliver content? How, how, how am I doing? And it was, um, 
they had to answer on a scale of one to four, plus they also had explain. I told them, I want explanations, I want feedback as much as possible. That night I had them watch a video for homework after I collected these, uh, these surveys, which by the way were fairly honest as requested. <laughs> And it was only on the four verbs of Paul Vanderstadt and Nana Nasset. And I sent you guys, the Spanish two teachers, I sent you guys the link to that video. Um, next day we came in class and we did some worksheets. We did some activities individually and in groups. Just kind of worked around the room. And then at the conclusion I handed another survey saying, okay, very similar to this survey, very similar questions, but instead of how am I doing overall, what did you think about this particular lesson? Almost the exact same questions going across, but it dealt with online, and it was set up into two different sections. I'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Next day, we did some vocabulary work, and then the following day, we did the exact same type of an intervention. Uh, their homework was to do another video. This time, it was just on Ian and Seth. Came back in class, did some guided practice. Again, group work, individual. Uh, by the way, we also <coughs> had a very tiny little five-point <coughs> quiz at the beginning of the class, just to make certain that they watched the video. Uh, five points, it was real simple. And then I gave another post-lesson survey. Very simple, the first one, yeah. So, how, I have two questions about these videos. How long are they and who produced them? Uh, I did them. And they are supposed to be 10 minutes or less. Based and on, are they like you speaking or are they? There's um, no right way to do this. Um, no, I know, I'm just curious about yeah. what you actually What used. I personally did is I took a PowerPoint presentation and I took those slides I made them into pictures, and then I inserted those into a movie. So the transitions were in the movie, much better than the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, they recorded my voice, and then I just overlaid all that. And I did it in two different ways. One of them was with the power, a newer PowerPoint that I used theirs, and uh, then the at last two I did were just me speaking over the PowerPoint. And, and is your delivery all in Spanish, or are you explaining the grammar in English? Well, it's in Spanish, too. It's the first time, so it's primarily in English. Okay. Yeah, just kind of scaffolding here, just kind of giving them the, the impression of what it is. Where did you put it when they got access to it? YouTube. It's all on YouTube. And then this is like con inspired? Not so much con. Con is a different type of, um, of a flipped classroom. He doesn't really have a flipped classroom per se. What he does is it's, it's an academy and you watch the videos, you take online tests and it goes through a series of steps to help get closer to mastery. Most teachers that go into a flipped classroom mode don't really like the Khan Academy so much as far as the way that they do things. It's pretty good for a general overview to kind of do some surface stuff, but it's really hard to get deep and in depth. And there's nothing in there for Spanish. Yeah. All right, but I mean, but the actual video lesson portion, would that be kind of in, is, is that different? Or well, like I said, there's, there are so many different types right. of videos. Some, it actually started with uh, teachers standing here giving lectures to college classes and filming it because there were so many people who miss it and they just allowed the lectures online. And it was just the lecture, but they watched yeah. it online rather than being in class. Yeah. Did you have to deal with anyone saying, oh, my internet was down, of or course. my computer's yes. not working? <laughs> yep. And don't how did you them. deal with that? <laughs> or, and, and did you give them a couple days to watch it? Or just no, no, just, just that one day. There, um, and what was the response to those that had problems? These are great questions. Number one, I told them up front that if you have internet issues, you need to talk to me because I made DVDs of these things I would hand out. Nobody came up to me and said they had any issues with them. I put uh, on their homework on school, and I told them, if you have any issues, you need to come to class 15 minutes early or come in during break or something. Mm -hmm. Watch it on my computer, because I had the DVD so I could show it on my computer. I said, you have no excuse. You just go. And most of the school, their school, the complete schools have gone totally flipped, 100%. And they just say, no, there's no excuse. There's enough possibilities out there that if you make the effort, you can do it. Because mm -hmm. like I said, the videos are 10 minutes or less. And the first two videos I did were five minutes, six minutes, something like that. The last one, <coughs> to that, that was a 10 minute video. It was just barely under 10 minutes. The about uh, I can't remember the author at the time. There's a, an author that talked about how your brain works and things like that. And they said, 10 minutes, you don't want to go over 10 minutes. They'll, they will disengage even at home, even though it's more entertaining to them than listening to a teacher talk. And then we know also that all the kids had 10 minutes of work. Yeah. So you're like, I get 10 minutes of homework this time. Oh, yeah. But there, there are other benefits hour, to this yeah. as well, because in cool. class, if I'm giving a lecture and the student doesn't quite understand something and I've moved on to something else, they're hesitant to raise their hand. 
at home, they can pause, rewind, listen to it again. Sure. And there are spots in the video that I just say, okay, pause here, take these notes down. I have a whole list of things that you're supposed to write down. So, that worked out pretty well for the most part. So that was my first intervention. Uh, the second intervention, of course, was, I'm sorry, that was my, I did the, I did the, uh, the, inter, the pre-intervention survey, and the one video, here's the, actually, the second video is here and said. This is the third video. This is one that was about 10 minutes long. Direct dodge pronouns. They're just not programmed to know grammar, so kind of went through a lot of different things and talked about what it is in English and different things like that. We dealt with it in class. Kids just said, oh, I get this. I understand what this means. I, I understand all these things. And then I gave the Chapter 3A grammar quiz. Now, I chose the Chapter 3A grammar quiz because of school loop. I have access to all the scores going back to 2006 on the exact same score, on the uh, exact same test. So I didn't give a post-intervention survey here, but I did give them the Chapter 3A grammar quiz. It was the following day after this. It wasn't this particular day. So we had, I had to do vocabulary work throughout all this as well. And how much improvement did you see? Well, that's where we come here. So after dealt with all this, I discussed the findings with the kids and different things, and I gave them one last survey. And this survey only had three questions. And I'll show you what those are and the results of those in just a bit. All right, so again, I have to go through these things. So I gave surveys, I gave a summative test, I had took a journal, did journal entry every single day. The surveys had what are called qualitative data, just like the summative test is qualitative, qualitative data. The journal and the free response section were quantitative data, so I took all that information, had to process it, and come up with some findings. Did you do the reflective journal? Did you reflect on the initial No, I did the journal. Oh, that was me for, for the program. This is my journal. I could probably spend the whole 20 minutes, half hour just on this. This is the the yellow bars right here represent the first survey I gave. To be, you know, be honest, what do you think about my teaching skills? What's going on? How much do you understand? I broke it down into two different sections. One is the content of the lesson, either by lecture or online. And the second part was, what do we do in class, and how did that help? The green bar right here represents the first lesson, dealing with set, stop, pull them, ten, f, and the orange line represents the video on the set. Like I said, I didn't give a post survey on the direct dodge pronouns. What's pretty obvious is that everything is higher from online. I mean, it's just, they had a much better feel of, of everything. There are things like, I completely understood what you were saying. I understand the content. Uh, I was able to pay attention without distractions. That was this one right here. So you can see the lecture versus uh, watching it online as well. The distractions was kind of a big deal in that one. And then in class, what do we do? How do we, when we work together in groups, did that help you understand the material better? Uh, does this help the way you learn? Asking them about their learning styles and their preferences. Uh, and then how effective you think this lesson was is the last one right here. So you can see that in general, I think it's, you know, on a scale of zero to four, I guess just about three is horrible, but it's not awesome. And then we get about three and a half for the online lectures. So that was their feedback on the, just the straight numbers, what we call the quantitative uh, measure on all this. My final survey asked three questions, and basically either I agree or disagree. Uh, and it was their impression. Do you think that online flip lessons has the potential to increase your achievement? 88 students said yes. 16 said, students said no. One just had no opinion. <laughs> Which we all have. Second one. I believe that the flipped classroom helps us focus better in class while we're doing things in class. Obviously, again, they feel that yes, this is much, much more beneficial. Third question is, I would like to continue having flipped classroom lessons. Most of them said yes, you get a few and say, no, I don't know, and the tenors like they're on board. So overall, that last survey really told me something about one of my, uh, my research questions. Now let's get into the 3A grammar quiz. This red line right here represents the average from 2006 to present. 
I've got 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, and 13. 2011 in Spanish 2 didn't get through chapter 3 being here. We got through chapter 3A, so I didn't give this quiz in that year. But generally speaking, it's pretty close. I've got a couple of classes that are way off the charts, way off the charts. And then interestingly enough, with the flipped classroom, I've got two classes that are just straight on the average. And then I've got these two classes. It actually did worse. And so I had to decide, OK, what, what causes something like that? that? That really surprised me. Based on all the research I had done, this should have been up here, in my opinion, based on what I had been seeing about the classroom. So I thought, OK, well, maybe I've got an issue with a GPA. Maybe I've just got lower level students this year. So then I went back and I took all the data from their first semester GPA grade. And I averaged all those out. And the red and the blue lines are going to stay there, but you're going to see some other data pop up. The, the red line's going to be covered by something else, but it's still there. Red line's right under this blue line. This blue line right here, the teal line, represents the class GPA. So over this seven year period, the class GPA and the chapter three grammar quiz are almost identical as far as the class averages. This uh, purple line right here represents the overall class GPA. So I wanted to see if there was some type of a correlation. And you can see that I've got a couple classes here that are lower. And that's, it could explain some of these dips right here. Last year, period four, another pretty low performing class. But there's a little disparity here about their GPA and their, and their, their test. I looked over here and I saw this major disparity in 2008 that I had a class that kind of went down a little bit. But look how well they did on that grammar class. So there's some things here that it's just really hard to explain. Everybody's different. But there was a slight correlation between their overall GPA and how they did on this grammar quiz. I still had to try to figure out, okay, why did they not do well? That was still one of the biggest issues. So what we had to do is try and get all this data, the survey data, the test data, the qualitative data that was also included in the survey, and come up with these findings. What did this all tell me? So when I asked the question, the second question, what impact will it have on student engagement, I think it's pretty obvious that they liked it more. They, they definitely in class felt more confident. They understood everything that was going on and explained to me they understood it and they paid attention. That to me was, was really one of the key findings, that they, they actually engaged and they enjoyed what they were doing. The problem was is that my second question did not seem to support that this is worthwhile as far as academic achievement because it either didn't affect achievement at all or it actually went down. So as far as the engagement goes, yes, no problem. Uh, achievement, what happened? I came up with three things. One of them I called the illusion, illusion of competency. <laughs> because they understood what was going on in class, because as, as they, they had group work sometimes, they had the open book, they were able to do all these things, they thought, yeah, I get this, yeah, I get this, they didn't say. They just didn't study. They didn't memorize the endings of the irregular verbs. Uh, direct object pronouns, honestly, they did wonderful on them. But as far as the irregular verbs, they just didn't memorize everything. Things were just getting crisscrossed in their head. But they understood it. They just didn't memorize it. And in the reflective journal, I was writing down that I had very open conversations, candid conversations. I showed them those graphs. <laughs> Period 3 was not happy to see that graph, but they saw it because we needed to know. I, I needed to know. And they all agreed that, yeah, we, we really thought we understood that we didn't really spend much time out of class because we didn't feel we had to. I felt rushed. Even though I had more time in class to go over the material, I still had to do vocabulary. I, I gave surveys. I discussed this whole project. I just didn't feel like I had enough time. If I had about another three class days, I think the achievement would have gone up. I just had three more days. And I probably didn't, you know, my first effort at flip classroom, I could do better. I could definitely improve on what I was doing. Uh, I was trying to do some of the similar things, and I didn't really go deeper into understanding to see, okay, do you really understand this? I could have probably done a few different tests along the way, a little bit more assessment as we went along. You know, Rob, um, and maybe also that they'll get better at this as well. You know, after that first experience, when they yeah. see it and they're like, oh, we had that illusion of confidence, we have the discussion. That's why one of my recommendations right there is we should expose this for a classroom and all levels. There's really no reason not to. 
because it doesn't take too much effort. You can find a ton of information that's already out there. I just wanted to do my own. For my master's, I wanted to do my own for the classroom. There's a ton of stuff out there. When you say there's a ton of stuff out there, there's already a teacher who's already done all the, yeah. you can just go a Spanish one, verb endings or something like that. Credit versus okay. imperfect, yeah. Most of them are, are um, like I said, people giving lectures, which I didn't feel were beneficial. Some of them were, they, they wanted to film themselves in front of an interactive screen and different things like that. There's, there's no wrong way to do it. Just whatever you're comfortable with. I think especially in Spanish too, especially the second semester, we need to extend our time. We need to get a little bit more deep. And this goes right into the Common Core. Right. I'm mean, perfect for Common Core. Just spend a little bit more time. It means that Spanish three students might <coughs> not have been exposed to quite as much information, but they're going to be better at, the, at credit versus imperfect, and be better at reflexive verbs, object pronouns, different things like that. I need to spend more time planning the classroom activities, do a better job of that. Uh, we as a department can look at videos, find videos, create new videos for these things, and then again come up with some different forms of assessment along the way to make sure that they understand what's going on. I also had to come up with possible future research. I'm going to continue as long as we take this textbook. I'm going to keep the same three um, tests and just kind of see if there's a curve, if there's something that's going on. We've had a new focus on reading. That's been a major issue on these tests. The students say they don't understand what they're reading. So I'm hoping that maybe as we go through that, that's also going to impact things. One of the things I saw in that graph is as things went up, and all of a sudden there's been this big decline. Uh, it wasn't just this year. It kind of started last year and the year before. It's a minor little decline. Just different calibers. I also think that might be from no child recognition. Do we have do we have fewer days? I mean, last year we had fewer days in our school year. Not significant, because I looked at those previous years and how much time did I spend on Chapter 3A, and it was identical um, two weeks. Well, what about having, um, like, students, especially, you know, the post-AP and IB, what about having those kids be assigned to, to create a video for one of, you know? I think that would be a wonderful start assessment. Using them. And you Great can assess idea. them on that and how well they did and everything else like that. And a lot of times kids learn better from other kids and the way they teach them other high-performing kids who understand what they're doing. Absolutely. And they're better at making videos anyway. Yeah. No, when I do Spanish 3, I don't, I require them to do like a video project. Like that. They love doing some of them. I think love if, if you had a couple good models of what you thought that you wanted them to do, and then, I mean, I'm not trying to force anything on the IBM. No, no, no. But, I mean, it's, I think it'd be a really effective way of using their time and after AP uh, that would be really nice use of time. The flipped classroom, some school districts, some teachers, they go 100% all in. That's all they do. Most people, they just kind of use it as another tool in their basket. It's just something else you can do. And I think that just a simple study like this, I was so micro-focused, it, it shows definite promise. It shows something that is worthwhile for us to, to try. Bravo, I'm loving this. Great. And I cover everything. I try to. Yeah, I like the idea of the rush of class, try and learn and write and do whatever to be able to do that at home. If the kid's motivated, you know, um, and plus you're front loading, you know, exactly. you're giving them, you're giving them the tools. We don't. We don't need the students. Will be able to anymore because they don't already know coming in if, if <laughs> what, they they, what they what they what they should know. So they, they just watch. Is there a way of, of like somehow like making sure that they do it? It's like you could. Well, have that's why. Them. That's why I gave the pretest. Right, but you could like also have the con or something. If doing you could definitely put some type of. Uh, a blog required, up there you know, and require them. That way you can kind of delve in there and see what's going on. Absolutely. What kinds of questions did you ask on the test to make sure they watched the video? Like what I put a question, I, I did grammar it? questions that were verbatim from the video. I see. That I, you know, when I said stop, pause, you take these notes and I gave several examples, I would no, have the no, exact no, same no, word no. for word example with the blank spot. I have kind of a thought, though, on, you know, when you're talking about that illusion of competency, which yeah. is something I often run into in level three. Um, but I wonder if also the problem is that kids think when they have a resource on video, 
but they don't need to take notes because they can always go back and look at it. And I think we all know that you learn a lot by taking yeah. notes. And so I wonder if you need to add a component in there where they have to actually do notes on it or something so that they're getting that additional forcing you could themselves set it up to. Like a journal thing. Well, that's what I'm thinking. That might be the missing piece that, you know, Very in your true. classroom in a lecture, they're taking your note. They're taking notes. And kids, well, the kids <laughs> tend to think, they tend to think when they see that, they go, oh, I'll just go back and review, which we know they're not going to. Right. Or they take pictures. Or they think, oh, I get it, I get it, I get it. Right. And then they that's, turn it off I mean, and I they don't. I think that's really probably the key to me. That would be my guess. <laughs> well, one of the things I do is I do put in there, pause here, write this down. So I, I do tell them to take notes. But the other thing is, is to give them a mind map. I, that's that's one of the that's one of the things. I okay. Next time I do this, I'm going to give them a mind map, and they need to fill that out. And that could be their mm. homework is mm -hmm. to show me the mind map rather than right. doing because there's the, the best thing to do is not do the same thing every time. Right. Right. Because kids will figure it out. And right. They'll they'll find ways around it as always. And there's always going to be the kids that don't do their homework. This is they this will not watch it. In the sign too, and we're we're the same. It's just the nuts and bolts and the grammar and the and our three verbs and you know whatever. So, and they think, you think they're understanding because you're going like this. It's like, okay, everybody, do they have bobble? And they all bobble, you know, and then I'll say, I'll ask a question, and they look at me like a tree. Well, that's why I gave those post-intervention surveys. Okay, we watched the video, we did things in class, here's your survey, what do you think? And oh, yeah, gosh, I get this, this helps so much. And they're just writing all these wonderful things about how well they understand it. Thank you for doing it this way, because it's so enjoyable. It also and they just didn't step. Well, I think if we if if we start a little bit early and we, we all incorporate this somehow, they get used to it, they understand what's going on, and then what, the reiteration will be when I do another flip class because I haven't had time to do another one, but they want they want they really want them. Well, so they give them more time. Give yeah. them a little bit more time and explain that okay. You think you understand it, but realize this is what the test is going to look like. Can you do this? Not just do you understand, but how, like how competent are you? Are you, are you giving, a, when you give a test, are you giving like a writing test? And how, are you, and how are you organizing that test? Well, the test that I gave on this one was broken down into three sections. One of them was the four irregular verbs of stop, well, that then ended up stop and credit. And it was a conversation with blank spots, and they had to, had to take one there. of those four verbs and put it in there and conjugate it and credit it appropriately. Uh, there was one that had one section just on Ian and said, and there was one section where they had to fill it in with the lower levels for us. The so but it's all in sentence, it's all in context, which is the exact same way that the textbook is set up. Do you have a, also separately, like you might ask that, I'm not seeing the word ask them a question and maybe you set it up incorrectly and let them correct you. Because it, it seems like, for me, receptive and I typically don't have to make the mistakes because they'll make the mistakes. So if they're writing something on the board, then I'll sit back and say, okay, and then let them find theirs. They'll find the errors of other students. But I usually don't intentionally put mistakes out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I just first first view you yeah, don't want to I, see the wrong thing. I agree. I, I don't think that you should bring uh, you should write sentences with mistakes. Uh, unless you tell them in front, it's like okay, you yeah. need to find the find the mistake. Yeah. 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 That's, what I'm saying. Right. It's That's possible. That, yeah. You know, the utilization of how grammar fits together. I, I again, it's just time. It There's time so many different it things here. That could be a, you know, a post a, video assessment. Right. That's possible. So. I was just going to say another interesting thing for the assessment would be maybe change the assessment in that one is just here's a chart, fill in the endings versus here's the conversation to see if it's maybe the conversation that they're not understanding or if it's just, you know, that... Well, again, endings. that reading comprehension is one of the biggest issues. Yeah, I know that's, that's a problem across the board. Yeah. So, but, you know, we're... They we're, can do the chart. They we're don't we're know focused that on that. Hopefully that will slowly rectify itself. Right. right. Least tell. And maybe in some of the formative assessment, focusing more on using it. Yes. In a way that's practical. Well, like, I didn't. Do I mean, I don't know what. I didn't do any formative assessments yeah. other than just the post video. Context. Which right. Which was right. very simplistic. But right. if I had done another one in the middle of all this before we did the summer, it is. They probably would have done. Well, no, I mean like the practice in class. But no, we. Well, in class we did all sorts of different things. They they did conjugations. They saw 
that's when they did the group work. Something that I would give for homework that I would look at and go, okay, this will take me five minutes to do on this page, mm -hmm. let me go. We literally on that first day, it was the set, I'm um, sorry, stop, pull that to then and I'll set up. They spent a good half hour and they were arguing and they were discussing. Oh. It, was, it was the most amazing That's thing. Interesting. That's good. But they, they spent so much time on it, and I know for a fact that they took that home on their own. They're like, yeah, I don't care. Yeah, right. it was good. So that was pretty well, amazing. So and you said it too when you're actually interacting with them. But again, they had that illusion that they were competent because yes. they were able to discuss yes. it and figure it all out. But ultimately, they didn't memorize it. Bottom line, they just didn't memorize the ideas. Mm -hmm. They understood it. They understand all the irregular predators. They understand the direct out predators. They just didn't memorize the ideas. And Maybe you need to isolate that and first give them a quiz where you have to do these endings. Yeah, they, they all now have a stack of about 20 flashcards that include every irregular verb, the card, and they have both of the card verbs, are verbs. Yeah, yeah. They have the ER and IR verbs that don't have uh, mm -hmm. that didn't have vowel. They all have an example of that, and we deal with that in class all the time. Okay. If I had done that before this, that, that would have gone off the charts. I'm yeah. absolutely positive if I had made them do those flashcards beforehand. Love it. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you.